Kia ora, um, Kota Mai Tene Ra. It's good to be here uh, today uh, and thank you for, for joining us. As Karen said, my name's Steve and... I'm Becca. And um, we, uh, we're together engaging learning voices. Um, and again, I'd like to welcome you and thank, thank you for joining us today. And the purpose of today is to take you through the joys and purpose and power of using um, narrative pedagogy. Um, and we're going to go through that experience with you um, and the way that narrative pedagogy can be used not only to empower individuals and schools, but also help them to realise their identity at a time of change. So in our time together this afternoon, as well as encouraging you, hopefully to be to feel empowered, we're going to be um, reminding you or uh, that it's important never in your schools uh, or for any educators to surrender your stories. So we're going to structure things a little bit differently today. Rather than start with the explanation, i.e. the explanation of what narrative pedagogy is, and then move to an experience, we're going to reverse that process and start with the experience and then kind of unpack it and explain it during the process um, and afterwards. So rather than talk, we're going to get you to do. Uh, we're going to facilitate a discursive workshop. So engagement is the key. So if you're hoping to sit back and uh, finish your coffee, then um, you could do that, but we're all doomed to an hour of silence. So hopefully we'll do as little talking as possible in this. In this. And um, what we're asking, what Becca and I are asking you to do is to go with this. We will unpack as we go through and it will, and the process will be explained. So narrative pedagogy to explain it just before we start is the use of our stories and our voices to create a firm understanding of identity and then use that to drive and inform sustainable growth, change, development, and in our case, within a school. And we've developed a tool, we've developed lots of tools that relates to you and, 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 and the work you do in education as a group to experience this. So Becca and I use a process to assist schools primarily to pause before they change, to reflect on their where they're currently at and review their position and own that before they go through to initiate the process of change. And we're gonna go through that with you today, very shortly. And yes, you will feel like guinea pigs and yes, you will feel like part of an experiment, but if that feels uncomfortable, then just remind ourselves that's what we ask our students to do every time they enter a classroom. So like we ask them, we're asking you to trust the process. Think of it as moving more from the micro situation to the macro. We're gonna start with the, um, the experience and the example, and then we're going to unpack it and place it in a wider context. Uh, and it will, at that stage, make sense. First, a little bit of background. For us, we use voice, uh, and voice and the voice of, of the people involved in education in schools is what we use, and their stories to empower and inform. So we use voice to allow for ownership and contextualization. And we're about schools creating their own narrative, and the first step of that is listening to their stories and understanding who they are before they have it done to them. Now, the primary focus we use for this is to create a, a safe, initially a safe fictional space. It's fictional, so it allows for depersonalization a little bit, but it is a mirror. The stories that we put in our scenarios that you'll be going through are based on reality. They're based on what happens in schools. They're based on stories we've told or heard. But by, by fictionalizing them, they create a safe space. So it's not, a, if you like, it's not threatening to the, the participants who go there. And we go from that to ownership. Um, and that allows schools to pause in safety and reflect before embarking. That's enough talk by introduction, so let's get you onto it and let's get through the gates of Willy Willy School and let's get you to meet some of the staff and people within that space. Over to you, Becca. Um, and, you know, we need to practice what we preach. So rather than share our screens for the next session, we're going to put a link in the chat for a Jamboard. Um, so once the link's been popped into the chat, we'd just like you to open the Jamboard. If you look at slide one, what we'd like to introduce you to are two of our leaders at our fictional school, um, Mia and Shay. They're our senior leaders. They um, come across lots of frustrations like we hear from the leaders we work with. Um, they also pull each other in and out of the learning pit. So um, as you move to slide two, this is the task we've set up for you. Um, you're going to listen to some voices from a school, very real voices that we have heard. And within your breakout room, there's a nice cosy number. So you'll all have a role to play. One of you has to assume the role of the narrator. We're expecting quality narrator voices as you're reading the scenario. Um, the narrator will also read um, any stage directions and the silly whimsical word at the end. We'd like one of you to be Shay. 
the senior leader, and one of you to be Mia. The other people in the breakout room, what we're asking you to do is to be the audience and the listener. And on slide one, you'll see some instructions that we'd like the listener to think about. So we'd like you, as you hear the play script, um, to think about what is happening to Shay, our senior leader in this event. Why is Shay feeling like this? And how did Shay's dilemma get resolved? When you come back to Steve and I, what we're going to ask you to do is to describe what you have learned about Shay's professional identity. So although you do this task, when you come back to the room, you're just going to write in the chat what you've learned about Shay's professional identity. Thanks for uh, participating in that. And um, it, what, you know, I hope you saw the point of trying to present a scenario that was one step removed, but identifiable. Um, and so what we want you to do now is to share your thoughts based on that scenario you just heard in the chat. What do you think about Shay's professional identity? What type of leader do you think he is and how do you know? So in actual fact, the discussion you've had in your group, you're just quickly sharing some key points about it in the, in the chat room. You can, have, um, you can all participate or just have, have one. So we, and while you're doing that, I'll just continue to talk and, and before I refer back to your comments. So we use uh, the fictional school, Very Very School, and scenarios like that to create a, a safe area where schools can look at an issue, uh, an, an, uh, an identified issue, um, which either we've picked up or has been brought to our attention. So we're quite responsive and quite quickly responsive to what we're hearing going in schools. And they can look at it, with, uh, um, and this one is concerned with you know, delivering PLD or delivering a staff meeting, but it's a mirror. And as, as it's one step removed, just like Bertolt Brecht used in Epic Theatre, it can be depersonalised a little bit, and you don't have to take it on personally before you can identify the theme and the issue being talked about. And then safely, you can reflect it back into your world. So, so the, the scenarios create, a, a um, if you like, a, a mirror and a pause point. And then from that, you can, you can filter it and then build the identity based on what you say and you do in your immediate context. So just responding to, to some of the things that's coming in there um, is the, the first one from, from Karen about the disillusioned young leader. As I was saying before you, uh, before the, the other group joined us, that scenario was created primarily because we were working and hearing from a lot of very young leaders who have either been promoted to team leaders or DPs or new roles like leaders of innovation within schools. And they're very young and they were questioning their ability and their skills to lead older staff members. And it was that kind of traditional hierarchy being upset. So we wanted to create a scenario whereby that was that, that feeling was being legitimized. And so that lack of confidence that comes through from Judy um, and being pushed back, I think all leaders feel that. And then they wonder whether they, they you know, so it's about putting that out there, not saying, hey, how do you feel? Are you overwhelmed? And then the defense mechanism's going up. It's about saying, this could be a reality. Now filter it through your reality and see, take that as a starting point. Um, when we're rolling out PD in times of change, it is overwhelming and not knowing where to start. And I, I think we've all been uh, in leadership roles slumped in a corner of the staff room, not knowing how the next session is going to go or how it's going to land and feeling a little bit overwhelmed by that. That does cause exhaustion. It does cause lock of, loss of confidence. And it, you, and it creates, especially in young teachers, a, a loss of confidence in, um, in their ability to lead and therefore take risks. So our worry is that it'll be fought back to what they've always, always known. Um, we use humour, and we'll come to humour in, in, in a minute. We use humour a lot so it doesn't become too much of a dark place. Schools have been pretty dark places recently, and, and, and we see part of it, like the use of bat snorkel and little silly little words and that, to create a, a, a bit of, um, hopefully, a bit of laughing at that and thereby at ourselves. Um, so thanks for that, um, that, that, that feedback in the chat room. That seemed to go really well. Becca? Yeah, um, so a teacher's career path we see is a really rich narrative and there is loads of research out there. We're not completely crazy um, and we're just going to drop in the chat a particular piece of research by two American psychologists and they had a real interest in um, how we can promote leadership pedagogies by capturing short stories and lived experiences of real people and professionals and then using those short stories to learn from it. So if you're interested in how you can do that with your leadership team um, have a read of the research but their study encouraged us to understand that our interactions and experiences are a great source of professional learning now in that first task you all tuned into Shay's discourse his experiences and we invited you to then reflect on what he was experiencing 
Now you listen to that narrative and it helped you form an idea about his actual professional identity. Now the daily experiences and stories we actually engage in as professionals all help shape our own identities and they make us who we are today. And it's these very rich narratives when we reflect on them, um, be they successes or failures, they're actually what helps create that ideal future context for us. And, and the thing is, even though we're talking about a school context, this is not this is not unusual or, or, or weird because it's what sharing of stories and um, and um, our voice is what makes us human. You know, we've all listened to a, a song or read a poem or seen a movie and it's resonated with us and it's had an emotional, uh, either good or bad, anger or happiness, joy or tears um, response. And, you know, we, it's, it's like it was written just for us or that person was acting just for us. And it's been a huge emotional response on our part. Uh, music does it all the time. But when you think about it, that song was written by someone in another country uh, at another time, possibly, who doesn't know you, will never meet you and doesn't even care about you. But but the fact that they wrote that song and, and it touched an emotional thing is what makes us it's what makes us human. We absorb that into our life, and that's what we do as humans. We we don't think that armadillos do it, aardvarks don't do it. The jury's out on whether dolphins do it or not. I don't I don't want to make a, a statement there. But what makes us human is this ability to use metaphor and story to create meaning in our lives, and that's how we come together as a community and as a group through our stories, through Fakatoki, you know, and, and Proverbs, and the, and the, it's how we make sense of things. So this story making is what we build our culture on, it's what build culture, what culture built on, myths, uh, histories, all that sort of thing. So this is not an unusual concept. And if it works and for us as a species in society, um, then it, it should work in schools as well. So all we're doing is, is, is reducing it down to something that, that is, is, in a school community and using the voices and narratives and stories and metaphors of schools and education to help create the culture of belonging and collaboration in the same ways we do in society. Thanks, Steve. What we'd like you to do now is if you look at slide five of your Jamboard, if you're good at multitasking, we've got a quote from Daniel Pink. I'm pretty sure Daniel Pink was responsible for writing for Al Gore at some point too. And he's got a lovely quote there I'd like you to read when you're back in your breakout rooms. And what we'd like you to do is take everything you've learned so far. So the activity where you experienced Shay's professional identity, the corridor you just heard Steve share about narrative pedagogy, just maybe leave out the dolphins. Um, and what we'd like you to do is come up with a 15 word definition or explanation. Imagine you're going to explain narrative pedagogy to a colleague tomorrow. You're gonna to say, yeah, I went on this awesome leadership lab connect webinar it was awesome I want to tell you all about narrative pedagogy you only have 15 words to now do so so as a group we'd like you to firm up a 15 word no more please you can have less definition of what your understanding is so far of narrative pedagogy so thanks again for that for that second breakout room and and, and working with the Daniel Pink and I'm just working through um, we've got two definitions up there um, sharing your own stories which is, and listening and hearing, and, and that word listening uh, from Greg is, is and, and not only listening, but listening to hear. Um, I, I quite like the way those two words go together because that's important. I'm gonna come to that in a minute. And connecting the theory and understanding and the, that word connecting again, and then moving to shifting. So it's, it's that kind of like captures what we try and do very nicely. The idea of hearing, connecting, and then shifting. And, and, and we see it very much, it has to be in that process, as well as, as Karen says, allowing for the space for people to share their stories, allowing for the time to pause, as I said earlier, that importance to pause. And so people can actually reflect. And I would suggest that as a profession, we are absolutely abysmally poor at reflect at professional reflection. We don't spend time on it, we do it quickly, and we don't, even though we, and we will often say, oh, that was a good lesson. It must be because um, I had them before lunch. That was a bad lesson. The wind is blowing. And we don't actually unpack or reflect our pedagogy as much as we, as we should. So it's about creating a space for that as well. Um, I'm only, uh, there's just two comments up there, isn't there? Am I, am I correct in that? There's another one just in. Is there? Oh, yeah, uses stories to create a, an authentic context in which to listen, learn, remember, and connect. And that, again, all three of these are wonderful. That's, 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 that's a lovely one to, to move on with, though. It's the idea of the authentic context, and we use that authenticity a lot. And, and, and um, I think that's a lovely phrase there to use there, where we listen, again, we learn, and we connect. 
and that's the idea of connecting. And, and it kind of like those three definitions move nicely into, into, the, into the next stage, if you like, of the process. And that next stage is when you've heard the voices, um, it's, that, it's like a divergent zone that you have to go through as a staff or as or when you're running a PLD session or anything. People have to have that chance to put their voices out there safely and hear their stories and reflect on their stories. And it's often conflicting stories. It's the divergent zone where there doesn't seem to be much connection. But if they don't go through that and then you don't go through the grown zone where you're trying to find some connection and you're trying to find and you're kind of like bartering and all this kind of stuff and you're, and you're trying to find some common ground. You can't get to the convergent zone where you have a shared purpose purpose you've got to go through the divergent to the ground to get to the conversion otherwise you just have the small circle the small group in the side of the staff room um talking and, and, and muttering um, um and that sort of thing so, so it's an important process to go through to, to create a safe space for that in many respects for a person to really feel connected to the institution they're part of they need two things they need to be feel that they are a person of worth an individual of worth within an institution of purpose. By listening and sharing stories, you are creating the feeling that a person is of worth. I have been listened. And then when they can come together in that convergent zone, then they are, are able to see that now we have a common purpose. I've been listened to, now we have a common purpose, which I am part of, which is bigger than me, but I have been heard. And you, I don't think you can necessarily get to that common purpose before you've had the, the discussion, first of all. So we're trying to create a world where um, that they are, uh, uh, validated and their voice is valid not always um you know they don't get everything they want they might you know still be in the aardvark zone but at least they've been had that chance to express that point of view thanks um, Steve. yeah um so what we'd like you to the reason of bringing everybody here together is we what we want you to take back to your schools is to think about the stories and the richness that actually lies within the schools that you work in or you are in Think about your own voices from the um, professionals who have these very real experiences. Think about what have they learned from their experiences that shapes their careers and their identity. And what we help, hope you do is encourage you to reflect on their discourse to help build their professional identity and then help them consider how stories and reflections can help them apply a new strategy for the future. And to do this, we're going to send you afterwards um, a PDF of one of our many tools. I think we currently have 50 at the moment. Um, and this tool is what you're going to be using, hopefully help to help you do that. And um, think about, you know, your strategic direction in 2023. And is there room to hear or use narrative pedagogies as you move into 2023? And then what we'd like you to do is turn on your Jamboard to slide six. And it's over to Steve. And as we go through this next stage, which is moving more to the macro stage, you've been involved in the, in the micro stage, if you like, where you've been um, participating in, in an activity. We're going to go through uh, using this diagram, which is on slide six, the next steps or, or how it plays out after that, which is where uh, in, the, in the group that Becca and I were in, Judy was, was, was taking the conversation. So um, if you refer to slide six, uh, and I'll, I'll refer to it, any comments that you um, have, any wonderings that you have, please put down in the chat as we're going through and I can refer to them or Becca, or if they're too hard, I'll give them to, to Becca to answer um, and throw her under the bus. So what you've got here is, is that idea of a partnership when as a PLD member or even as a, a leader in a school, we are trying to take a staff in a certain direction. Now, the first thing we said is the importance under the partnership of accepting and embracing self identifying self. So in that space one, what we got you to do, first of all, was we got you to um, unpack and listen to Shay's story, listen to his voice, because that's safer than putting you on the spot, but inevitably you use his experience as a reflective mirror. So in that space, in Wenny Wenny School, in that, um, uh, that virtual space, it's a safe space. You listen to the voices of the community, of, of the scenario. And you unpack that. You unpack his professional identity while you're coming to grips with narrative pedagogy and, and to enable you to get your head around the issue of how to deliver effective PLD to a, to a staff as a young leader. And you were able to listen to the voice, which was one step depersonalized. So having created the, the space, you then create the voices which people can listen to. And then we, what we do next is we do, um, present a, a very simple tool whereby the schools can start taking ownership of, uh, of the process. 
So this is where they move from, if you like, the fictional world and start relating that fictional world to their real world. And they use this tool to gauge and test the voice in their, in their own context, like you did when you were coming up with a definition for narrative pedagogy. Um, and then you, you were reading a Daniel Pink quote and relating to that and having a discussion in your groups. You relate it back to your world. Um, and in that way, it becomes more purposeful and more authentic. And that word authentic uh, came through from your definitions. So you review your, your, your situation, you discuss that, you move through that, and that's part of the learning. Now, in, in that whole way, that, that last cycle is the, is the idea of the culture. Now, you came across a term, bat snorkel, which obviously is a made up word with a silly little picture with it. Now, the purpose of that is because we all know that educators use edge speak and jargon all the whole time. So why don't we make up words to describe what's happening in Wherry Wherry School? Now, they're supposed to be um, they're not supposed to be serious at all, but they are, again are, are, are words that are made up to describe how teachers feel. And each scenario has one of those words with it. It's part of creating that culture of care, not only a culture where it's OK to laugh, where it's OK to, to feel a little bit silly, where it's OK to laugh at someone else and thereby ourselves. But it's also a culture of care. So when we're looking after the well-being of a group, it's, it's about creating a space which is non-threatening as well. But all the way as you're going through this, you are reflecting on your own experience. And we come back to that idea that it is very much a, a mirror. Now, that's the, the situation you've largely gone through in microcosm today. You haven't actually used a tool as such, but there is one which Beck is going to talk about, about shortly. But it's by giving, you the, by, we, by giving this tool to you or to the school, we're trusting you to take ownership of the experience now, where you create your own reflections based on your professional identity, and the tool will help interrogate, explain who you are as a leader um, and inform where you need to go. Hopefully it gives motivation and innovation to, it, to innovate and experiment on, on your developmental journey. But you've been able to arrive at that without, without ripping yourself apart. You see, the second stage of that ownership is where further taking it from this, the trust in the process is, is, is allowed for. You consolidate your voice. You understand your own voice. You interrogate your voice and you can innovate from there. Often in PLD and in, in change, we go straight to that second one. And we go straight to that second one, the why and the how, um, the what and the how, without reflecting on the why. So all we're trying to do by the use of narrative pedagogy is to create a space where that foundation, that voice, that, that, that essence, that mouldy of who you are as a school, as a leader, can be established first. And that becomes the, what you return to when the storms get, um, get, get, when the seas get rough. Without it, you're being done too all the time. And, and, and then you are giving power away to an external force. Now, it might be someone like Becker or I who comes into a school, uh, and, and that's very dangerous to give away power to someone, not to me, but to Becker. It's, it's very dangerous. Um, but um, I'm perfectly safe to give power to. But, but, or, or you're waiting for it to be done to you as a school. Now, as PLD providers, when we go in, we often feel the need also to prove ourselves and to say we're here for a purpose. And so sometimes we can fall into that trap as well of doing two before we've had the chance to listen. Um, and schools will sometimes, when they're sleepy and tired, allow us to do that. And then, you know, hopefully in an hour's time we leave and they can get back to the, um, the, the marking. Um, so, so it's about creating, it's about turning things on its head a little bit and creating that, that, that world. So to take you to the next stage of how this tool that is developed that you had the first part of, how that looks in the next stage, I'll pass back to, to, to Becca. Oh, hang on, I'll just um, see if there's any, no, no, no questions there. Okay, all good, back to you, Becca. Right. So if you look to slide seven, what we're showing you is basically we've um, took snapshots of the tool that we're gonna send you. So the tool's called Tuning In, um, and you have the script, the same script that you read in your groups about Shay and with the word bat snorkel. Then typically what we tend to do, rather than, um, make teachers and leaders read a whole page of research or you know 158 page doc that we probably shared in this link for you to read we know teachers don't have time to do that so Steve and I do all the reading of the research because we actually enjoy that 
And we kind of synthesize everything we've read into usually a one pager, two pages, if, if, if it's really deep. And what we do is we pick out the, the highlights and then we draw your attention to where you can go to the research if you want to dig around a bit more. So we try and um, make it teacher friendly and usable, that, that bridge between academic research and the realities that you've got you know, half an hour to to unpack this before your staff meeting. Um, after you get the research that we've synthesized, um, we do an explanation. And within our explanation, it's very um, loose, loose enough for you to contextualize and innovate to your own way that you want to run the, run the session. So we, we recommend guidelines, but you don't have to stick to those guidelines. And in fact, Steve and I actually love hearing stories of where somebody's taken one of our tools and, and done something different with it. Um, that's actually what makes us more proud because we know you've had ownership over it. But if you are just starting out, the, the guide is, is, is a good thing to do. So the tool that you're going to be given um, has three parts to it. So there's the Daniel Pink task. That, that's the task we did where we unpack what narrative pedagogy is. And then um, the blue section, the first blue squared section, that's for you to identify your professional identity. So you could do this as a whole staff or just do this yourself. And what we ask you to do is to think about a narrative in your life where you may have suffered or experienced rather conflict, failure and promotion. And we ask you some basic questions about those, those three things. And then we have a reflection box at the end to make you reflect on actually how those stories have helped shape your own professional identity. Then when you turn to the next page, which is called Tune In and Listen to the Music. And if you're of a certain age, you'll hear the, the musical pun there. Steve's well old, so that was his musical pun. Um, yeah. We ask you to go through Maybe some brothers stages. Are still older than me, though. <laughs> So we ask you to think about simply the best. I'm sure you can all work out which musician that's from. The right here, right now, and the one step ahead. And then we ask you to think about um, your favorite PLD session, your staff meeting, whatever it might be in that order. And then that helps you create your narrative for the future. So that's the tool we're going to send out in a PDF to you. Feel free to use it on yourself or with your staff. Um, and then if you want to know about all of our other tools, I think we have about 50 now. If you turn to slide eight, there's um, that's our, the link to our website. We also have a hard copy of an educational resource book that you, you know, some people like the hard copy, um, which you can buy on our website. And then we've got the silly whimsical A to Z book as well. Um, which actually just has all the silly edu speak and whimsical words in, which is quite a fun gift um, at the end of the year for your staff. So yeah, feel free to pop to our website. Some of our tools we offer for free because Steve and I actually don't make a lot of money out of any of this. We um, have a day job as educational consultants and Steve and I do all this in our own time after work. So we'll have a day in the office and we'll ring each other up and talk about the stories that we've heard. And then Steve and I get to work on designing a tool um, all in our own time and we put it on the website. And so we're kind of just, yeah, we're, we're not making a buck. We're just trying to share back to the community we love so much. Um, yeah, and I hope people enjoy it and use it and, and learn stuff about themselves. Anything to add, Interesting Steve? Interesting enough, people are always surprised about this before I move on to the last slide, is that Becca and I have only actually been in the same room four times. Um, so, so our entire working relationship is largely... Um, I always get scared the four times I've seen Becca because she's got legs. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, you know it's, so it is an example of how in this, in this post-pandemic world, you know, professional relationships can flourish. Uh, despite the fact that they you know, feel any physical proximity. I'd we like actually to, feel I'd like quite to awkward when we're in the same room. <laughs> yeah, 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 it is, yeah. it is, it is, yeah, because um, it's a 3D image as opposed to a 2D, 2D image. Um, the, um, I'd like to go to the last slide now, you know, and I'd like to finish on this point before I ask for any, um, any questions that anyone has or any wonderings um, um, in the last bit, um, is that we said that we, you know, the, the, it's what gives us a sense of uh, narratives and stories, and, and that is what gives us meaning, gives us purpose, gives us identity, gives us culture. And we found this little poem, we found this little poem some time ago, and it has actually driven us, and it has defined what we, what we do. And we think it's quite powerful. And so we illustrate this. So it's the idea of, of come to the edge, um, and it's, it's come to the edge, and we might fall. Come to the edge, it's too high. Come to the edge, and they came and we pushed and they flew. 
And we use that as a driver because, you know, it's that whole idea. If we keep on doing because of tiredness or exhaustion, the same thing in the same way and expecting different results. Well, as we all know, the cliche, that's the definition of insanity. And sometimes you just have to do things a little bit differently to get that forward propulsion, to get the, the caterpillar into a, into a butterfly. And if it means being a bit quirky, telling stories, um, using whimsical words, just to, to shake things up a little bit, then that's one way of getting people to go to the edge and then going over the edge. Without that, then they'll probably plummet as a caterpillar to their, to their, their to, and, and, and to their death. You know, which we which we don't particularly want. The um, so again, we find that we refer back to that. That's our, if you like, fucker Tokyo. That's our um, um, our that, that 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 defines our culture of what we're trying to do. And so we find our stories and we find our voice in a variety of places. Um, and by the by, Steve and I don't just make tools for leaders. We make tools for teachers um, and also students. Um, and the student stories that we hear when they use the tools is is awesome. Um, Pulse is our favourite one that we we listen to all the stories during the pandemic of the, the children who were missing their friends. They didn't like the virtual space being online. Um, so we created Steve's uh, the talented artist, by the way. And um, so he drew a picture of a, a busy classroom. Um, and then we've actually taken it into schools and used it with staff and students. Um, and there's this gorgeous story about um, a little girl who she looked at the picture and she was saying she was the nervous child outside the classroom who's looking in at the window. Um, and then because she hadn't been at school for so long, when finally at the end of the lesson, she was the girl who was dancing on the table. And she said when when she was asked to explain the transition between the two characters she'd chosen, she said it's because she felt brave and she was really glad that she came into the school. But that picture prompt helped build her narrative and helped her um, reveal a picture of what was happening emotionally and socially for her. Um, so, yeah, the, the kids. The kids are very much a part. I mean, Steve and I see everybody in the education ecosystem is equally important. And we're very privileged in our weekly experiences. We can be talking to the media, the ministry, caretakers, Farno, students all of the time. And we, we listen to every single one. So at Witty Witty School, we include um, everybody. So we have the caretaker at Witty Witty School. We have the, the mythical blue creatures called the Wibbles, which... Um, represent our, our wonderful relievers that we have trouble trying to get hold of um, all of the time. So each character, we have the academics who um, we won't reveal how they're rep represented, but they're in there too. And um, we have the tired principal beaker who can never have a conversation with anybody apart from his clock or his coffee cup because he's so busy and he's forgotten to how to communicate with the world. So we, we try and capture everybody within our fictional school. You just met Mia and Shay today. We also have um, Phoebe and Ray who represent our quirky 14 year olds who um, are very sassy and have sussed all of the adults out. Um, yeah, so enjoy. And I guess, you know, in closing, you know, we, we expect our we expect our teachers to empower our students. We talk all the time about learner agency and intrinsic motivation and, and, and getting students who are who are you know, agentic and that. And I guess that what what we would like to think that we'd like to be part of and why we think that you know that narrative pedagogy and listening to stories it's about empowering teachers as well in the, in the same way the same thing the same journey we want we expect our students to go on. we would we'd like our teachers to go on especially in this in this new post pandemic world and part of that is about them creating their own narratives to be able to drive change and to own change we need to know who we are first before we can um we can really do it and so that's i guess the, how where we see the the power of something like narrative pedagogy.